the Epilepsy Foundation is pleased to share with you an educational webinar on psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. The mission of the Epilepsy Foundation is to lead the fight to overcome the challenges of living with epilepsy and to accelerate therapies to stop seizures, find cures, and save lives. My name is Dr. Elaine Kiriakopoulos, and I would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone who has joined us this evening. I'd like to review with you the format for tonight's webinar. During the speaker presentation, all phone lines will be muted. We would like to encourage everyone to submit their questions at any time during the webinar. To do so, type your questions into the question window on the GoToWebinar panel and click Send. We will then read your questions aloud during the question and answer portion of the webinar. Please try to keep your questions general in nature as the webinar is intended for educational purposes. This webinar does not take the place of individual medical advice. The webinar will be recorded and available for viewing and listening on epilepsy.com. The Epilepsy Foundation is working to provide information and education that serves the spectrum of individuals and families impacted by epilepsy. It is common when you have a question about your health or your loved one's health, you may hear or read things that you're not quite sure how to interpret. The Foundation's webinar education series aims to bring together expert clinicians and scientists who can share with you the most up-to-date and accurate information to help answer your questions. We will start off this evening's learning with a brief review of seizures and epilepsy. The human brain is a complex and dynamic structure that contains approximately 100 billion nerve cells called neurons. Now, neurons communicate with one another by sending and receiving electrical impulses and chemical signals. This communication helps us to move, to think, to feel, to see, to hear, to learn, and so much more. The electrical activity in the brain is usually very carefully balanced. So normally, a single neuron or a small group of neurons will send a signal to accomplish a task and then stop firing. A seizure occurs when abnormal and excessive electrical activity temporarily interrupts normal brain function. This disruption of normal baseline brain function can be seen in the photo on the bottom right. So this is a, a snapshot from an electroencephalogram, an EEG that records brain electrical activity. And what you can see about a third of the way in is a burst of abnormal and excessive electrical activity representing seizure activity. So that's a visual representation of really the definition of a seizure of abnormal and excessive electrical activity. It's important to recognize that every brain has the potential to seize. So one in 10 people worldwide will experience a seizure during their lifetime. It is also to remember that not everyone who has a seizure has epilepsy. Non-epileptic seizures can occur with other physiologic conditions. And a couple of examples would be, say if a person is experiencing a blood sugar abnormality or withdrawing from drugs or alcohol, this may result in seizure activity, which is not related to a diagnosis of epilepsy. A seizure can have many different outward signs. So it can be a staring spell, a muscle twitch or spasm, trouble speaking or thinking or wandering as some examples. Some seizures cause a person to collapse, fall to the ground, shake and lose consciousness. And this is what most people think about when they hear the word seizure, because this is the type of seizure that's often depicted in the media on film or television. But this is just one type of seizure. 
There are other seizures that have very few outward signs and they can be as subtle as a funny sensation or an unusual smell that a person experiences. The way a seizure looks depends on the type of seizure a person is experiencing and the area of the brain which is affected. The diagnosis of epilepsy indicates that a person has a risk to have recurrent seizures or more seizures. It does not indicate that the, the cause or the prognosis, and there are many different types of epilepsy. Tonight's webinar will focus on reviewing psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, often referred to as PNES. PNES is not a seizure and it is not epilepsy. PNES are sudden changes in behaviors, movements, sensations, and or responsiveness that are variable in duration. PNES may represent a response to conscious and or unconscious emotional distress. Tonight, to help us better understand psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, we are honored to have with us our guest speaker, Dr. Andres Kanner. Dr. Kanner is a professor of clinical neurology, head of the epilepsy section, and director of the Comprehensive Epilepsy Center at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Dr. Kenner was born in Mexico City where he grew up and attended medical school at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. After graduating from medical school, he came to the United States where he completed residency, residency trainings in both psychiatry and neurology, as well as a fellowship in epilepsy and clinical neurophysiology. Dr. Kenner is quadruple boarded in neurology, psychiatry, clinical neurophysiology, and epilepsy. He has a long-standing research interest in the area of pharmacology of epilepsy, the psychiatric aspects of epilepsy, and surgical treatment of treatment-resistant focal epilepsy. He is the past editor-in-chief of Epilepsy Currents, the official journal of the American Epilepsy Society. He has served as the co-chair of the Neuropsychobiology Commission of the International League Against Epilepsy and as chair of the epilepsy section of the American Academy of Neurology. The Epilepsy Foundation is very fortunate and grateful to have Dr. Kanner serving as the co-editor-in-chief of epilepsy.com and to have his steadfast support on the vital programmatic work of the foundation. Dr. Kanner, thank you for sharing your time with us this evening and for all you do to support the Epilepsy Foundation and the epilepsy community. Thank you, Elaine, and thank you for the nice introduction. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I have no disclosure to report for this presentation. What I'd like to do in the course of the next 30 minutes or so is to give you an overview of this very important problem of uh, psychogenic non-epileptic seizures that we uh, face every day in an epilepsy center. So what is a psychogenic non-epileptic seizure? It's a paroxysmal, which means a sudden involuntary event that can mimic or be easily misdiagnosed as an epileptic seizure. It is not caused by any type of organic brain dysfunction it is not associated with abnormal electrical activity in the brain. And a psychogenic non-epileptic seizure, in fact, is not and should not be referred to as a seizure. Unfortunately, this is a term that has been used by most of the community in epilepsy. And, you know, we are stuck with this, uh, with this term. But I want to emphasize that a psychogenic non-epileptic event, and I will call it that way, is not a seizure the way that Eileen uh, described it in her introduction. So why do people develop non-epileptic seizures? The use of the term seizure uh, 
all often result in confusion for individuals affected and their family members. So when we use the term seizure, and it is not an epileptic seizure, uh, often patients and family members have a hard time distinguishing, well, do I have epilepsy or is this not epilepsy? So that's why I don't like the use of the term seizure. It delays also the correct understanding of the diagnosis in many families and individuals affected by these conditions. What do psychogenic non-epileptic events look like? As I said, they can mimic a convulsive seizure, also as you know, a, known as a grand mal seizure. However, they are uh, uh, events that have very atypical characteristics, and these include thrashing movement of the entire body, arching posturing of the back. The person can be responsive during the event, despite the fact that they're moving all four extremities and moving uh, their entire body. Typically, a person in the midst of a psychogenic non-epileptic event has their eyes closed, whereas people with epileptic seizures have their eyes open. It is very typical for psychogenic non-epileptic events to be long in duration. And because of the atypical characteristic of psychogenic non-epileptic events that mimic convulsive events, physicians often can suspect the correct nature of the event. On the other hand, psychogenic non-epileptic events can also mimic a non-convulsive seizure where the person has motionless staring. They usually keep their eyes closed, as shown in this picture. Again, they're long in duration. And those, unfortunately, may be more difficult to suspect uh, from a uh, uh, typical epileptic seizure. One of the red flags that I often use in the clinic is the eyes closure, uh, which as I said before, is very unusual in epileptic seizures. So how big of a problem it is? If we look at all the frequent type of paroxysmal non-epileptic events that we see in an epilepsy clinic, psychogenic non-epileptic events are the most frequent type of, of these type of events. One, out of every four to five patients that are referred to an epilepsy center with a diagnosis of intractable epilepsy do not suffer from this disorder. So one out of every four to five people referred to an epilepsy center with a diagnosis of intractable epilepsy do not suffer from this disorder. And the majority of these are suffering from psychogenic non-epileptic events. It accounts for 5 to 20% of the 1% of patients diagnosed with epilepsy. Psychogenic non-epileptic events can affect all ages. They occur in children, adolescents, adults, and elderly people. They're more frequent in adolescents and young adults. 80% of subjects that have CNES are aged 15 to 35 years old. They tend to affect women more frequently than men. And in most case series, 70 to 80% of subjects are women. 10 to 30% of people with psychogenic non-epileptic events <coughs> have had epileptic seizures in the past or are having comorbid current epileptic seizures. So 10 to 30% of people can have both epileptic seizures as well as psychogenic non-epileptic events. One of the um, uh, psychogenic non-epileptic events is one of the neuropsychiatric conditions for which a person is less likely to get the appropriate treatment, unfortunately. And this is a huge problem that we face after we make the diagnosis. The lack of treatment results in repeated hospital admissions including to the intensive care units, unnecessary prescriptions of anti-epileptic drugs, 
and high economic and social burden to the family and society. The misdiagnosis and mistreatment of psychogenic non-epileptic events as epileptic seizures has been estimated to cost between 110 million and almost a billion dollars every year. And these costs are absorbed on costly diagnostic evaluations as people are admitted repeatedly to inpatient VDG monitoring units or intensive care units, inappropriate administration of antiepileptic drugs, and the, the repeated use of the emergency department by people affected by these conditions. What are the causes of PNES? So PNES is a heterogeneous disorder. There are many causes. We identify a variety of psychiatric disorders, and the most frequent ones include depression and anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress disorders, and personality disorders. And very often, people can have a mixture of all of these conditions, depression and anxiety disorders in uh, the setting of post-traumatic stress disorders, and some of these people can also be suffering from personality disorders. However, when we evaluate these people, 20% do not present any current psychiatric disease at the time that they are evaluated in our monitoring unit. Why is that? Because the psychological cause that triggered these events may not be operant anymore by the time that the patient is evaluated, and we may not identify any current psychiatric condition. Very often, people affected with psychogenic non-epileptic events have been victims of a history of sexual, physical, and emotional abuse. And this makes the treatment of these people at times very challenging. As we said before, psychogenic non-epileptic events do not have abnormal brain electrical activity. And this is a very important concept because when family members or other people are witnessing an event, they obviously are afraid that they are, are, are going to have harm to their uh, brain. Um, and in fact, this is not the case. And I always re reassure the patient and the parents and family members that during the event, there is no harm done to the brain of patients. The symptoms of psychogenic non-epileptic events are we usually reflect a conscious or unconscious psychological conflict or a psychiatric disorder. In the majority of cases, psychogenic non-epileptic events are not purposely produced by the person experiencing these events. And this is a very important concept because in a big percentage of people, when they're presented with their diagnosis, the automatic reaction is, you mean I'm faking the event? And the family members also react in the same manner. So it is essential that physicians clarify, these are not events that are purposely produced by the person. Most of the time, they occur unconsciously. Individuals are not aware that the seizures are non-epileptic, and they, they may become very anxious over having these symptoms. Now, psychogenic non-epileptic events may be spontaneous in their occurrence, or they may be triggered. Some of the triggers include physical symptoms, emotions, thoughts, or memories. For example, in people who've been victims of sexual abuse, the memory of uh, the person who had accosted them sexually may trigger these events. Some uh, of the events can be uh, uh, triggered by certain type of visual stimuli, 
noises or smells that may unconsciously remind them of a traumatic experience. And these are uh, situations that people have a very hard time facing. When you have a psychogenic non-epileptic event, you lose, you basically, your brain shuts down in order to protect you from a traumatic memory. And this is a natural form of the brain to uh, um, save the individual from the overwhelming uh, memory that was very traumatic. And by shutting down, the person may not be aware of what's going on around them and may not respond to people around them. Now, sometimes psychogenic non-epileptic events can occur in people who are relaxed and there may not be apparent triggers. Psychogenic non-epileptic events is a response to stimuli not entering conscious awareness as we stated before. Now, in a, significant, in a certain percentage of people, people with psychogenic non-epileptic events can also suffer from epilepsy. Five to 20% of people with psychogenic non-epileptic events may also have epileptic seizures or may have experienced seizures in the past that are under control on anti-epileptic drugs. The occurrence of epilepsy and psychogenic non-epileptic events is seen with higher frequency in people with cognitive developmental delay. And this is not surprising because when a person with cognitive developmental delay experiences a seizure, he realizes that he doesn't have to go to workshop. And therefore, as a Pavlovian reaction, he uh, starts developing psychogenic non-epileptic events when he wants to avoid some situation that can be stressful or uh, uh, a situation that he may not want to face. So psychogenic non-epileptic events can be seen in people with epilepsy but the epileptic seizures and the psychogenic non-epileptic events are clinically different. And in our evaluation of patients with these conditions, we identify the epileptic seizures and the psychogenic non-epileptic events and establish which are which. Now, among the comorbid conditions that people with psychogenic non-epileptic events uh, have, there is post-traumatic stress disorder, as I mentioned before, people who've been exposed to a traumatic experience because of emotional, physical, and sexual abuse. But we, we are seeing today an increasing number of our veterans that are returning from the war in the Middle East that develop post psychogenic non-epileptic events as a reaction to the very traumatic experiences they, exhibit, they experience during their uh, 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 battle uh, field. They also uh, may have an increased history of traumatic brain injury. About 50% of patients with psychogenic non-epileptic events have a history of being diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder and having a history of past traumatic experiences is not a requirement for the diagnosis of psychogenic non-epileptic events. Some studies have also shown that traumatic brain injury is present in up to 50% of people with psychogenic non-epileptic events, but we don't yet understand why is that association present, but we have seen that as a common co-occurrence. How do we make the diagnosis of psychogenic non-epileptic events? The way we do it is by bringing patients to a VDG monitoring unit in an epilepsy center where patients are placed in a room. The EEG uh, recordings that um, uh, record the electrical activity of the brain is run continuously together with a video. And the idea is to 
identify or capture the typical event. When the typical event occurs and uh, the electrical activity does not show any abnormal findings, we can establish the diagnosis of psychogenic non-epileptic events. In most cases, the diagnosis of psychogenic non-epileptic events can be achieved in the course of a 24 to 48 hour VDG monitoring study. But sometimes the duration of these studies has to be prolonged, particularly in people in whom we suspect that they may have had a, a history of epileptic seizures, either in the past or currently. And in those cases, the radio G monitoring study can be extended to up to a week or even 10 days. What we do is we remove the antiepileptic medication and allow the person to uh, uh, experience his or her typical epileptic seizures under the control of the VDG monitoring unit. It is essential that when we record the event, that we show the event to the patient and family members so that they can establish, yes, this is the typical event that uh, uh, this uh, person has been experiencing and for which evaluation was requested. Sometimes people may experience events in the monitoring unit that are not their typical events, and we cannot uh, establish a diagnosis unless it is clearly established by uh, a family member and the patient that these are their typical events. Sometimes people may have, when they're not having seizures, Abnormal electrical activity, what we call spikes and sharp waves, even after we've established that they have psychogenic non-epileptic events. These sharp or spike waves tell us that this person at some point in the past may have had epileptic seizures, and those people need to be further evaluated so that we can know what do their epileptic seizures look like in contrast to the psychogenic non-epileptic events. Now, we have to be very careful when we reach a diagnosis of psychogenic non-epileptic events, and we must, to, we must be sure that we've captured the typical event, as I said before, that the recorded events were non-epileptic events of physiologic origin, and these are organic type of events such as sleep disorders, syncope, movement disorders, a vascular event like a, a, a transient ischemic attack, or certain epileptic seizures sometimes can have very typical manifestations and can mimic non-epileptic events and can be misdiagnosed as psychogenic non-epileptic events. And these are particularly seizures that originate in the frontal lobe structures. But there are differences in the clinical presentation of these epileptic seizures so that when we see them, uh, an epileptologist can clearly establish a diagnosis. But uh, physicians that are not specialized in epilepsy may sometimes uh, confuse these type of seizures with non-epileptic events. And we have to recognize that a person may have both epileptic and non-epileptic seizures, as I stated before. Now, what is the expectation that people will stop having these events uh, after the diagnosis is made? Is it a realistic expectation? What the studies have shown is that between 20 and 50% of people stop having psychogenic non-epileptic events once the diagnosis is reached in the VDG monitoring uh, unit and the uh, diagnosis is explained to a patient and family member, even in the absence of any treatment. However, 70 to 50% may continue to have non-epileptic events even after the diagnosis is, is, is made. The variables associated with the remission of these events include the occurrence of these events in children and adolescents, a short history of the non-epileptic events, a psychiatric disorder that is of mild severity, 
in people who is, who are uh, suffering from chronic psychiatric conditions, such as people who have a long history of depression, anxiety disorders, PTSD, and personality disorders, those are people who are more likely to continue to have events after the diagnosis. And the reason for that is very simple, because the psychogenic non-epileptic event has become a coping mechanism against situations that cause great distress or that uh, remind them of traumatic experiences. And those situations will continue to affect the individual until treatment is provided and the proper treatment is provided. It is important that people with psychogenic non-epileptic events, particularly those with chronic psychiatric history, be advised that their events may persist if, even after the diagnosis is made so that they have the uh, understanding of uh, what to do if these were to happen. So how is uh, the treatment of PNES? We know that anti-seizure medications don't work in the treatment of PNES. Individuals diagnosed with this condition are usually referred to a psychiatrist and a psychotherapist to learn to manage stress and become familiar with coping techniques. Cognitive behavior therapy can be an effective treatment for psychogenic non-epileptic events. And that's the type of therapy that we recommend for most of these people. The type of treatment, however, has to be individualized to each person. The person with a diagnosis of PNES need to follow up in the neurology clinic in the absence of identified psychopathology following psychiatric and neuropsychological evaluation. Pharmacotherapy for the underlying affective anxiety disorders or PTSD or other psychiatric disorder is recommended. And this is in the for and, and psychotherapy as well. Psychiatrists and neuropsychologists should be part of the epilepsy team together with a neurologist. The common type of psychotherapies used to treat PNES, as I said, are cognitive behavior therapy, mindfulness based psychotherapy. Interpersonal and psychodynamic psychotherapy has been used, but it's not been found to be as effective as cognitive behavioral therapy or mindfulness. Prolonged exposure therapy is a specific type of cognitive behavioral therapy that is provided to people that suffer from psychogenic non-epileptic events and post-traumatic stress disorder. This type of therapy helps patients emotionally process post-traumatic experience. And we find that family therapy is an adjunct to any of the above therapies. It is very important that the family be involved in the treatment of these patients so that they have a clear understanding of how to help their uh, loved ones that are still uh, struggling with these events, in particular in uh, pediatric uh, patients that present with this condition, that I also encourage uh, my adult patients to also have family therapy uh, or at least the family uh, participating in some of the therapies that uh, they are going. Now, there are unfortunately obstacles to treatment, and these can result in an inadequate treatment of psychogenic non epileptic events. The causes are multiple. One is a refusal to accept the diagnosis of psychogenic non epileptic events, and this is not unusual because of the lack of understanding of what the psychogenic non-epileptic event is, or the misinterpretation that when the physician presents the diagnosis, they are implying that the person is faking these events. That often results in a resistance on the part of the patient to accept the diagnosis of PNES. Person and family have difficulty distinguish the concept of epileptic versus non-epileptic seizures. 
it's very important that a person with DNES have a clear understanding of what epileptic events are and non-epileptic events are. Because not having a clear understanding can lead to confusion. There is unfortunately a lack of access to mental health care professionals to treat these conditions. And unfortunately, there is poor communication between neurologists and mental health care professionals, which results in the patients being referred to psychiatrists and the psychiatrists then returning the patient to the neurologist, telling them, no, you have epilepsy, you do not have a psychiatric or a psychological condition. And therefore, it is essential that the neurologists continue to be involved in the treatment of the person with psychogenic non-epileptic events after the diagnosis is established. The reason for continuous involvement of the neurologist includes that people with psychogenic non-epileptic events very often suffer from headaches, and some of these headaches can be quite difficult to control. Sometimes uh, people with psychogenic non-epileptic events can also suffer from other neurologic disorders. There can be possible unsuspected epilepsy that may be unmasked after the medication for seizures is stopped. And the persistence of psychogenic non-epileptic events after diagnosis can often result in emergency room uh, uh, transferred by emergency services an intensive care unit admission. If the neurologist is involved in the care of the patient, the family can call the neurologist who can then provide the proper information to the treating physician in the emergency room and avoid unnecessary treatment that can result in uh, intensive care unit admissions. So the first therapeutic goal has to be that the person affected and their family members have accepted that the events are non-epileptic seizures. Given that repeated hospitalizations and admissions to intensive care units are the greatest cause of morbidity and mortality in patients with psychogenic non-epileptic events. For example, in a study of 164 uh, people with psychogenic non-epileptic events, 51% were admitted with what we call pseudostatus, that is prolonged uh, non-epileptic events that mimic status epilepticus. And 38% of these people ended up being admitted to the intensive care unit, and very often they are intubated and placed on, in a coma protocol. And that can result in significant complications. So what I tell patients, and family member, if you have an event, do not go to the emergency room. Deal with the event at home. The person is not experiencing any brain damage. Wait until the event is over, and then call your, your therapist or your psychiatrist, or if necessary, your neurologist for further advice. But do not go to an emergency room because it is very likely that the ER physicians may not recognize that you're having non-epileptic events, and you end up being admitted to an intensive care unit. Sometimes even in epilepsy centers, psychogenic non-epileptic status can be con uh, confused with true status epilepticus, and this happened in 10% of 567 people randomized into one of four arms for the treatment of status epilepticus and those people did not have epileptic seizures. They had pseudostatus. So we have to be careful. Up to 30 to 50% of people with psychogenic non-epileptic events have been at one time or another admitted to an ICU with an incorrect diagnosis of status epilepticus. It's important that we communicate with, uh, uh, with each other that the neurologists, the psychiatrists, and psychotherapists communicate with each other, that the psychiatrists had a clear understanding of the diagnostic evaluation 
and the reasons as to why these events are not epileptic seizures, it is essential for individuals and family members to accept the diagnosis and treatment recommendations. I have seen at times that a patient can accept the diagnosis, but the family members do not, and that causes significant conflict in the person and persistence of these events. Sometimes the way we present the diagnosis to patients and families may not be the best way of presenting the diagnosis, and it can be misinterpreted by patients and family members as if we're implying that the person is faking the events. Very often patients interpret these things as if we are saying that you are crazy, and this automatically results in a refusal to accept the diagnosis. And as I said before, the communication of the diagnosis must always include individuals and family members. After the diagnosis is shared, we recommend that a person stay in the monitoring unit for at least 24 hours in order to ensure that the person affected by PNES and family members had a clear understanding of the diagnosis before their discharge home from the epilepsy monitoring unit. Now, should antiepileptic drugs be discontinued? As we said before, antiepileptic drugs do not work for psychogenic non-epileptic events, so they should be discontinued, with the exception of persons who suffer from mood and, and anxiety disorders who are taking an antiepileptic medication that has mood stabilizing and anti-anxiety properties. And we have several antiepileptic medications with these properties. So if the, if the person is suffering from this condition and is on this antiepileptic medication, we may elect to leave them on these medications because they may yield a therapeutic effect for their underlying psychiatric conditions. But it's very important that patients understand that they are uh, kept on these medications not because they have epilepsy, but because of the uh, treatment of the underlying mood and anxiety disorder. If the person, in addition to the psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, has comorbid epileptic seizures or has had a prior history of epileptic seizures, then in those cases, we may not stop the antiepileptic medication. And the patient has to understand clearly the reasons as to why they're taking the medication. Should patients with psychogenic non-epileptic seizures continue to follow seizure precautions? It has been established that during the psychogenic non-epileptic events, a person can harm himself or others. And so it is recommended, in my opinion, that people with psychogenic non-epileptic events be uh, advised to follow the same precautions as patients with epilepsy until the remission of this event. They should not be allowed to drive until they're free of events. And the duration of spell-free period must be considered on an individual basis. So it doesn't have to follow necessarily the duration that people with epilepsy have to wait uh, after having had epileptic seizures. How long should a person continue to see a neurologist after a diagnosis of psychogenic non-epileptic seizures? As long as individuals, family, and mental health professionals consider that the neuro neurologist involvement is necessary. So this is something that has to be discussed with a neurologist, with a psychiatrist, the psychotherapist, and among family members. These decisions should also be based on a comorbid history of seizure disorder, either in the past or current, a common, uh, the, the presence of comorbid neurologic disorders, such as headaches or other neurologic conditions. It depends on the individual psychiatric profile and the acceptance of the diagnosis. So in conclusion, it is critical that a correct diagnosis of PNES be established as soon as possible in order to avoid the maintenance of unnecessary pharmacologic treatment with antiepileptic medications and recurrent admissions to the emergency room and intensive care unit. 
Understanding and accepting that the events are not epileptic will allow for better treatment. Other comorbid psychiatric diseases should always be considered when planning treatment. And a team approach to care that includes the neurologist, psychiatrist, and psychologist is important. So with that, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to turn over the uh, uh, microphone to uh, Eileen, who uh, will have some announcements, and then we'll go to the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kanner, for that comprehensive review. Uh, we would like to end the presentation portion of this evening's webinar sharing with you resources to help you continue to learn about PNES and epilepsy. So speaking with your physician or your nurse is always a good place to start. Keep in mind that referral to an epilepsy center may be necessary for you to be able to determine if your diagnosis is accurate and what treatment options are best suited to help you. You can also find up-to-date information for reading and sharing with your family and caregivers online at epilepsy.com. For help guiding you to additional resources, you can call into the Epilepsy Foundation's 24-7 helpline. In addition, your local Epilepsy Foundation office can help to provide you with information, resources, and support, and can also help to direct you to an epilepsy center that's close to your home, where you will find medical providers who specialize in the diagnosis and treatment of both PNES and epilepsy. I would like to take a moment to again thank Dr. Kanner for bringing to our epilepsy community an exceptional evening of learning. And I would also like to thank each of you for joining us this evening and hope you'll continue to join us throughout 2019 as we aim to provide you with learning opportunities that help to answer your questions and guide you to the resources you need to help you reach your best health and quality of life.